Well, thank you very much, Miguel, and thanks for this great opportunity. Um, this is a fascinating thing you guys arranged at such short notice, and I very much appreciate uh, the invitation. So I am a cognitive scientist. I study how people think. And so what I'm going to be talking about for the next 15 or 20 minutes is um, what the cognitive processes are involved in prediction. So let me start with something that is presumably old hat to most of you, uh, that there are different ways to make a prediction. So one is based on basically using history, using the past to predict the future. So you can do this in more or less sophisticated ways. More sophisticated ways involve various kinds of statistical models. So for instance, we might predict recovery from COVID-19 in the United States based on the uh, percent recovery that we've seen in China. And of course, you can get really fancy doing this kind of thing. You can use statistical techniques to correct for different age distributions. Um, you know, people may live more farther or closer together, and so you might want to correct for that. You can correct for the number of hospital beds. And so you can use statistical modeling in more or less sophisticated ways to make predictions. But there are inherent limitations to making predictions this way. Uh, so for instance, how do you correct for the fact that on a particular day, there may be weather patterns that affect transmission of the disease? There's no real good statistical model to do that. Or how do you correct for the fact that our understanding of the disease is changing as we live through this pandemic? And our understanding of treatment methods of, is changing as we live through this pandemic. So the world is changing and it's not easy to use history to predict the future when you're living in a future that's constantly changing. Moreover, there might be cultural differences between China and the US, different norms for how close people stand to one another when they're, uh, when they're speaking, for instance, that could matter. So statistical prediction is fundamentally limited. Uh, why? One reason is that it fails to fully take into account the causal factors that influence things. So we might want to make predictions in a different way, based on causal understanding. So here is a ridiculously oversimplified causal model of what's going on, of a tiny little piece of what's going on with the pandemic. There's nothing official about this. I just drew it yesterday for the purposes of this talk. And the, the purpose is to say, look, we may know there are a bunch of causes of transmission. So there's, you know, the personal space between people, the number of interactions people have on a daily basis, the likelihood that any individual has the disease. Those are three, and there are probably others as well, three of the causes of transmission. And then recovery is going to be caused by both transmission and treatment. So now we're going a little beyond statistical prediction and we're using a causal understanding of the problem. So this is not mere prediction, it's prediction through understanding. And again, I wanna state this model is ridiculously oversimplified. The purpose here is not to present a causal model of COVID, but rather to give a, an illustration of what a causal model might look like. And what's nice about this is that you can change it as you learn more, right? So you could add causally relevant factors as they become relevant. You can even change your understanding of the effectiveness of treatment as treatment um, becomes more advanced. And not only that, but the real value of this kind of perspective is that you can imagine alternative worlds in which things are different than they are today. So you might say, well, what would be the recovery rate if we had a really effective treatment for the disease? 
or what would be the recovery rate if we changed the personal space with which people interact, which is exactly what we're trying to do around the world. In other words, we can make counterfactual inferences by making assumptions about the values of variables in this model, and that'll change our predictions. So we can make predictions about alternative worlds. Now, you don't get anything for free. There's no free lunch, as they say. And so if you're gonna do this, then you've gotta know some stuff. Like for instance, you've gotta know how treatment influences recovery. So there are some strong assumptions behind this that some of you I'm sure know um, in quite some detail, but the, the point here is merely that there are different forms of prediction and causal understanding does give a kind of power that mere statistical prediction doesn't, although it does make stronger assumptions. But causal models themselves are not silver bullets they themselves have some serious weaknesses. So for one, if you're gonna draw a causal graph, you need some pretty strong evidence to support your claims. If you're gonna say that personal space is a cause of transmission of the disease, then you better have some solid evidence and mere observation is generally not good enough. You need experimental evidence. In the best possible world, you would have experimental evidence, perhaps a randomized control trial or something like that. The point is merely that these kinds of models do require a stronger kind of evidence than mere statistical models do. Another limitation that these models share with statistical prediction is that there are, in Donald Rumsfeld's famous words, unknown unknowns. There are things that we just didn't even consider. They weren't included in our distribution of possibilities, and they're not included in uh, our causal model either because we didn't consider them, right? Whenever you have a representation, that representation is limited by what you have imagined the possibilities to be. So if something happens that you didn't even imagine, well, you know where you are. You're without a paddle, let's say. Um, so we didn't know that the UK would lose ministers. I doubt very many models took that into account. I, I, everybody seems shocked that toilet paper became as hard to find recently as it has become. Um, it, wa it, was an, it was not only an unknown that it would, uh, that it would be in short supply, but it was unknown that it was something we should even worry about. So, okay, so uh, sometimes this uh, quote is, is attributed to Yogi Berra, but uh, my sources tells me that the great physicist Niels Bohr was the one who pointed out that prediction is, is hard, especially about the future. What I want to talk about is one more reason that prediction is hard that I haven't mentioned yet, and that is human ignorance. That is, the vast majority of people don't know the vast majority of causal relations that are relevant. So consider the venerable toilet, something that you probably have lots of experience with. If I asked you, how well do you understand how a toilet works? What most people think is, they understand it pretty well. They have a good sense of what's in the tank and what's in the bowl and, um, whoops, and uh, their knowledge kind of uh, approximates that of uh, a plumber's supply manual, um, as you would see here. What in fact people know is that there's a lever up here and there's water in the bowl, and if you're lucky, then if you pull the lever, the water goes down. And not much more than that. In other words, for so many things, people overestimate their understanding of mechanisms, of causal models, of how the world works. Uh, there's lots of evidence to support this. I'm just gonna mention two pieces very briefly. 
originally the insight came from Leon Rosenblatt and Frank Kyle, who did what is now a famous study using everyday objects like speedometers, sewing machines, ballpoint pens, uh, toilets. And they asked people first how well they understood how these things work. And what you can see on the graph here is that people gave a rating of about four on a seven point scale. So people thought they understood pretty well how these things work. And then Rosenblatt and Kyle said to the people, okay, explain to me, how does it work? So what happened is the people tried to explain and they discovered they had nothing to say or very little to say, that they really didn't understand how these very common everyday objects worked. People don't even understand how ballpoint pens work. And there's good reason for it. They're actually pretty complicated once you think about it. Anyway, so R Rosenblatt and Kyle then asked people again after they attempted to explain how they worked, how good their understanding was, and people's self-rating of their own understanding went down to about three. In other words, people themselves admitted that they had lived in an illusion of understanding that their understanding was not as great as they thought it was. And they revealed this to people simply by asking people to explain. So my colleagues and I did the same thing with political policies in the 2012 presidential election in the US. We gave people a bunch of uh, hot topics that, um, at the time, policy issues that uh, the different sides had different perspectives on. And we did the same thing that Rosenblatt and Kyle did. We said, how well do you understand this policy and what its consequences would be? People gave a rating and they gave fairly high ratings. And then we said, okay, explain. Explain in as much detail as you can what the consequences of this policy would be. And just like Rosenblatt and Kyle, our participants had a really hard time generating explanations so that when we then again said to them, how well do you understand this policy and its consequences, people's ratings were lower. So we punctured people's illusions of understanding political policies simply by asking them to explain the consequences of those policies. And not only that, but we also reduced their confidence in their position on the policy. So they expressed less certainty about what the right thing to do was after we punctured their understanding. So we reduced polarization in the group, in other words, through causal explanation, suggesting that people's understanding is more uh, shallow than they understand it to be. Now, one interesting observation is that this effect did not occur when we asked people to generate reasons for their understanding. Reasons are not the same as causal explanation. And I'd be happy to discuss that at any length um, you'd like uh, in the question period. So the bottom line is that people aren't storage devices. If you take a thumb drive, you can get on eBay or Amazon for $12 or 10 euros then um, it can hold a few hundred thousand copies of this book I wrote with Phil Fernback. Um, but according to Thomas Landauer, who was a uh, great cognitive scientist, he did some back of the envelope calculations. He estimated this to be about 16 times the capacity of the human brain for symbolic information. He estimated that the capacity of the human brain is about one gigabyte. That's like one three hundredth the capacity of the com laptop computer that's sitting in front of you right now. In other words, people are not made to hold reams of information. I think what we're rather made to do is to extract deeper principles that are invariant, that we can apply to new situations. Okay, so why do people live in this illusion of understanding? Um, the idea is captured really well by the picture on the German edition of our book. Um, the idea is that it's because we live in a community of knowledge. That is, we think we understand because other people understand, 
and we fail to distinguish what we know from what others know. Right? It's the knowledge that's in the community that counts as opposed to the knowledge that's inside our skulls. And in fact, that's sort of commonsensical, right? What matters for fixing my toilet is not whether I myself can fix the toilet, but whether I can access the requisite information to fix the toilet. And this would explain why so much political discussion these days is so emotional. It's because we get our beliefs and our attitudes from our communities. We don't generate them ourselves. So when people challenge us, they're not just challenging us as individuals, they're challenging our team, they're challenging our family. And when we're defending our family, we get emotional. This is not a new idea. I'm gonna go through this really quickly because I see I'm taking much longer than I expected to. Many of the, these ideas you can find in Walter Lippmann's book from 1922, a study of propaganda in World War I called Public Opinion. Um, the philosopher Hilary Putnam has discussed related ideas, uh, discussed related ideas decades ago when he pointed out that meaning ain't in the head that when we are establishing reference through the words we use, very often we are establishing reference through knowledge that's sitting in someone else's head. If I say I'd like to, to see a piece of molybdenum one day, I don't have to know what molybdenum is in order to make sense of that statement um, and, or to, to even utter the statement. I merely have to believe that someone knows what molybdenum um, the curse of knowledge is the finding that people tend to think that others know what they know. This is the bane of teaching, right? It's very hard for a teacher to appreciate that their students actually don't know as much as the teacher themselves know. To the teacher, it seems obvious, but the students don't know it. That's why they're in the class. This is what makes teaching hard. These similar ideas from among philosophers, Andy Clark and uh, David Chalmers spoke about years ago. Social epistemologists and philosophy have discussed this. It's closely related to the notion of the division of cognitive labor and their cognitive scientists like Edwin Hutchin talked about this too um, in their studies of how human beings collaborate. So it's an old idea. Much of my work has focused on how it is that we go about outsourcing knowledge, how it is that we have others make our inferences for us. Um, so I've done some work with Nat Rab showing that we feel we understand merely when the people around us understand, even if we ourselves don't understand the thing. With Baba Kematian, I've looked at how we believe explanations, even when the explanations carry no information. What's important is that the explanations are entrenched in a community so that our community has a sense of understanding, even if we don't. Um, work with Eleanor Amit has looked at how we outsource many of our moral judgments, or at least parts of our moral judgments. And more recently with Danielle Cooper, Cooper um, we've looked at how deliberative polls, right? These are polls where you bring lots of people together and give them lots of evidence and give them the opportunity to discuss. Those things do change people's minds, but they involve very small numbers of people. You can scale them up simply by telling others what the result of the deliberative poll is. So you can outsource the deliberative poll in order to get lots of people to respond to evidence. So in general, the problem here is that we're tribal all the way down, right? We're tribal even in terms of how we think. We get our sense of understanding from because the people around us have a sense of understanding, but they might only have a sense of understanding because the people around them have a sense of understanding, and the people around them might only have a sense of understanding because the people around them have a... So, in other words, you can have a whole community that feels it understands, even though nobody actually does. And too much ideology, I think, is like that. Robert Armstrong put this really well in a review of our book in the Financial Times. He said, we imagine ourselves as rugged cognitive individualists, growing our own intellectual food and living in mental houses built with our own hands. 
This is a dangerous error. So how do we make predictions using a community of knowledge? Well, the one answer to this question that one comes across a lot these days that I'm sure many of you have thought of is that we make use of the wisdom of crowds. And that's true, we do. We can do that in multiple ways. We can do that through prediction markets. We can do that through Amazon reviews or reviews of anything that we find online. Take advantage of the knowledge that's out there and aggregate it in order to inform us of stuff we didn't know. But there's another way too, and that is um, by collaborating with others, by constructing collective representations of knowledge. So I'm gonna spend the last couple of minutes of my presentation talking about that. Uh, what I've suggested is that knowledge is a collective entity. We live in a community of knowledge. And so if we really want to reason well, we should find some way of representing all of that knowledge in a coherent form. So as a first step in doing that, we should understand what the components of that knowledge are. And it has at least two components. One is common ground, that is the very core superficial understanding that everybody has to have in order to live in our society, right? So everybody knows that there are flushes and the purpose of a flush is to make the water descend in the toilet. That's common ground. How that happens, however, is specialized knowledge. That's the kind of knowledge that plumbers have. So the, each of us brings some narrow bit of expertise to the community. So here's a, a picture to try to uh, describe what I'm trying to say in hopefully a more, more simpler, more co coherent way. So all of us have this very coarse causal model that says social distancing has the effect. So I'm sorry, I should say those who believe that social distancing is beneficial have a coarse co co causal model that says social distancing both reduces disease transmission, right? That's a causal relation. And it also produces loneliness. That's another causal relation. Those are two things we have to trade off, right? So most of us know that, but the actual knowledge is much more sophisticated. The actual knowledge out in our community is much more sophisticated than that. First of all, social distancing has many components, right? There's sheltering in place. There's how far you stand from someone when you're talking to them. There's how you organize a grocery store in order to keep people safe. There are all kinds of components. And each of those components have their own effects on reducing disease transmission. And of course, reducing the disease transmission is itself complicated. This is something that epidemiologists and infectious disease experts have been studying for decades and decades. So different aspects of social distancing are gonna have different causal relations with different aspects of disease transmission. Loneliness is also a rather complicated thing. Right? It can vary from feeling uh, a little bit of angst to serious clinical depression and lots of stuff in between. So that itself has many components and each of those components is caused in different ways by social distancing. So we have two different causal models here at two different levels of analysis. And in order to really understand humans and how to make predictions, we have a number of challenges. And there are actually deep philosophical challenges that philosophers have been worried about for a long time. How do you relate these two levels? What do we mean by a level, an, a variable at the high level, which aggregates information at the lower level, right? How, how, what does it mean to talk about causation at this high level, when in fact there's a sense in which what's really going on is at the lower level? These are deep and difficult questions, right? How do you even talk about representation, representing the world 
when reference is in other people's heads. If I'm using someone else to represent the world, then in what sense am I actually representing anything? Okay, so I'm not gonna answer these questions. I'm not even gonna try to. I've gone on much longer than I thought I would. Let me end with some final conclusions. Um, there are different methods for prediction, and these methods trade off how much you can believe the input into the prediction with how useful the output is. And in general, I would say that causal prediction is much more useful because you can modify it for the particular world that you're trying to make a prediction in. And that's hard. Uh, and, and because the world is changing all the time, that's almost always necessary. It turns out one thing that makes this hard is that individuals are ignorant, um, but communities are not necessarily, right? Societies can be intelligent if they make use of evidence, for instance, and thinking and judging are community activities. So this is really important. And the problem I'm leaving you with is how to develop better methods for representing community knowledge, because I think that's where the gold is. Okay, so thank you very much. That's what I had to say. And now I'm gonna see if I can figure out how to turn off my screen. And I see that there's one chat message, um, which is of no interest. And there are two questions. Okay, first question from Margaret Coetzee. From a cognitive perspective, particularly in terms of reasoning, knowledge, and thought processes, what are some myths, metaphors, and narratives you have, been, you have seen emerging around the coronavirus? And what do these stories reflect about the storytellers? Um, interesting question. Uh, I must admit, I haven't been keeping a tabulation of those stories, narratives, and myths. Um, you know, one thing that is very obvious is that the advice we're getting from the WHO and the government um, is biased, and it's biased for very good reason. So we were told for a long time that we shouldn't, at least in the States, but I was in France for a while too at the beginning, and we got similar advice there. We were told that you uh, didn't have to wear masks and a whole story was developed, a causal model was developed about why it's not important to wear masks, why hand washing um, is so much more important. And, you know, I think the purpose of that narrative was to make sure that the personal protective equipment went where it should go, to medical health givers, these incredible heroes who were surrounded by, who were doing such unbelievable work and showing such immense bravery. Um, and yes, they're the ones that should get it. But in order to convince us, I think it turns out that the experts were sort of lying to us because masks are effective, as we've now been told. Uh, so now we have a different causal model, right? So action in a society also depends on causal models. Um, okay, next question. Uh, Manuel uh, ABTW, do you believe that cultural anthropology research can benefit the creation of future narratives for what is to come post COVID? Um, so I certainly believe that cultural anthropology research uh, can benefit humanity in many ways. Um, I've become uh, very aware of the work, for instance, of Joe Heinrich recently, uh, who's done some beautiful cultural anthropology that I think dovetails beautifully with the work that Phil and I did when we were writing The Knowledge Illusion. Um, whether that research can benefit the creation of future narratives is a complicated question, right? Because there's a sense in which um, narratives are approximations to truth. They're attempts to build 
representations, anecdotes that, uh, that guide society, that bind society, that allow us to see things in similar ways um, without actually representing everything uh, that, um, that, that we know to be true. They're sort of necessarily deviations from truth because they're biased in favor of human understanding. So since cultural anthropology is a science, um, I, would, I would hope that the way it benefits us is by revealing truth, not by revealing narrative. Um, and I guess I see there are a bunch more questions, so I'll leave it at that. Next question is from Beatrice Ravignani. Uh, do you have ideas about how we, how can we as a so society surpass the individual ignorance? Um, I think the first thing we have to do is simply as individuals appreciate how limited our own knowledge is, right? That's step one, to reduce our hubris. We need leaders that let go of their hubris and don't think they have all the answers. We have to make use of expertise, right? We have to make use of the people in our communities who have thought most carefully and most neutrally in the most dispassionate way about how things actually are. And we have to uh, use their knowledge in order to inform us. Right? So we have to let go of our own hubris, and we have to find ways to maximize the use of expertise, which is an indirect way of saying we have to find ways to maximize our use of evidence. And the point of my talk was to say we have to think about what representations of communal knowledge uh, might be like in order to do just that. Okay. Um, this is funny not having any back and forth, but uh, feel free to, uh, to respond to what I've said if you can figure out how to do it. Um, George Wang asks, are there any real world examples you can reference of when the causal modeling tool was used in a foresight context? Um, that's a great question. Um, I do believe that causal modeling tools are used frequently by epidemiologists. And I do believe that um, there have been epidemiological models that, for instance, predicted the spread of the coronavirus um, from as far back as last fall. Uh, now, whether those were causal models per se, um, I, I haven't looked at the direct, at the references, so I can't say, but I'd be surprised if they didn't incorporate some causal notions into them. Um, other specific examples, I would have to look up uh, to give you references. Do you have any recommend, recommended resources for how to create effective causal models? So I think the important thing for creating an effective causal model is really understanding what the, what the nodes represent and what the links represent. Um, Judea Pearl is uh, one of the grandfathers of causal modeling. There were uh, a bunch of philosophers and computer science and statisticians, as well as economists even before that, who developed many of these tools. Um, but I think, uh, you know, at, at the risk of upsetting all of the other people who have worked on this stuff, I think Pearl probably offers the cleanest, most coherent packages for getting up to speed on how to do serious causal modeling. So if you go to his website at UCLA in the computer science department, um, it's Judea Pearl, P-E-A-R-L, you'll find all kinds of stuff. I will take this opportunity to plug a book I wrote in 2005, which is called Causal Models, how uh, we think about the world and its alternatives. 
and it's sort of a baby, it's intended to be a baby introduction to Pearl stuff. So Pearl's book is pretty heavy mathematics. And if you want to avoid that and just sort of get a feel for the, for the domain and see how it applies to psychology, then you might want to look up my book called Causal Models. Uh, Celia Masalink, um, please excuse me if I'm butchering your name. I'm doing my best and I don't have my glasses on. Thank you for the interesting presentation. Could you give some examples of how to use the wisdom of crowds or the vision of the crowd? Thank you. Well, uh, there are examples all around us, right? So when we cross the street, we have to use the wisdom of drivers for instance, by making eye contact with them in order to prevent them from running over us. But that's a kind of silly example. In organizations, it's a matter of um, developing processes which um, take advantage of the expertise embedded in the organization, right? So organizations are, are famous for uh, not taking full advantage of the knowledge they contain. And it seems to me good management practice is about good leadership, is about people being able to motivate and incentivize uh, employees to provide their full understanding so that they're working with the team rather than against them. So there's a whole bunch of principles for doing that that you'll find, for instance, in you know, management textbooks or organizational behavior textbooks. Uh, at the societal level, again, it's about taking advantage of expertise. Experts tend to be housed in evidence or grounded in evidence, right? That's what a real, an effective expert who's able to accurately explain, understand, and predict is someone who's grounded in evidence. So it's about methods for making decisions that are grounded in evidence, right? Listen to the health experts who've thought about infectious disease for a long time, not the politicians who've thought about it for five minutes and whose interest is in something other than doing the best for society. Um, so a, uh, another question from Muatassim Ismail, community knowledge may refer to different cultural representations of reality by different societies and communities, but also it can refer to knowledge of scientific communities. It may include natural emerging representations of the world, but it also may include politically motivated and manipulated representations through media and communication. All these types or versions of community knowledge are interlinked and co-constitute each other. How can we address this completely in community knowledge? That's really, really well expressed. I couldn't agree more. I think that you know, one reason we see the polarization in political society today that we see is because there are communities that evolve that are uh, who, whose beliefs and whose shared beliefs are based on either conspiracy or some uh, moment that people have agreed to believe in, even though there's no solid evidence for it. And then there are other communities uh, which are grounded in something quite different. And you know, the Enlightenment, it seems to me, was the period in history in which we developed justifications and rationales for developing these communities whose views are really grounded in evidence. So in the end, it's a value judgment, right? Who are you gonna have faith in? We ourselves as individuals can't know everything. We have to depend on other people and we have to make a decision uh, at every point in our lives who it is that we're gonna treat as our leader, as our thought leader. Which community are we gonna to belong to? And all I can do as a scientist is implore you 
to buy those arguments, to at least consider those arguments that have been offered by people who do care about evidence uh, to join the community that shares that set of values and beliefs. So I'm, I feel like this is a great question. Um, there's so much more to say, but I should probably move on and maybe we can have an offline conversation about this. Um, okay, another question from Maud Hassan Maud Said. If we assume predict that revealing true pandemic situation might make things worse, that's why data is not accurate. What do you think about this? I think that we should make decisions with our eyes open. So if we're going to tell people, so I, I see some justification in telling people that masks are not effective. And that justification is we save the masks for the people who really need them, the medical health professionals. But you know what? We could do even better than that. We could tell people that N95 masks, that the masks that medical professionals need and can't obtain, that those are no more effective than homemade masks, or at least that homemade masks are uh, sufficiently effective and teach people how to make them. And that's what we're doing now, right? But we could have done that from the beginning. I think when you tell people stuff that you know isn't true, you lose credibility. And it becomes that much harder to convince them down the road of things that you really want them to believe. Um, so I, I think it never hurts to be grounded in truth. Uh, which doesn't mean that you can't give advice that maximizes the society's interest. Medibo Fatundes asks, what insights from your work do you feel are most relevant to the future sensing activities of this community in particular? Um, so I've got to admit, I'm not entirely sure who I'm speaking to, so I'm not entirely sure what this community in particular is. So it's, it's a kind of hard question for me to answer. Uh, you know, I, I, I have watched a few of the other talks, but I'm not sure that I got a representative sample. So I'm not, I'm not quite sure who the community is. So I, I think the best answer I can give is, that, is the general one, that if we're going to predict the future, and if we want people to care about our predictions, then we have to make those predictions with an appropriate degree of confidence. And often, that confidence should be extraordinarily low, because often we're not in a position to make the prediction. And if we're going to bother making predictions to people who count, then we should get as much expertise to bear on the situation as we possibly can. I hope that's helpful. Okay, it looks like there's just one more question from Tena Alentar or Alentar. How do you see the thinkers of the future being made? Since we have, in one side, an increasing laziness of the thinking process, and on the other side, data science and AI to process and deliver reasonable results. Um, well, that's a very interesting question. I think the first thing I would do is take issue with both of your premises. That is, I'm not sure we have an increasing laziness of the thinking process. Uh, I have argued that people are ignorant, but I think that's an inherent property of being a human being, of being an animal on this earth. Uh, I think even people who aren't cognitively lazy are relatively ignorant. It's just that the world is infinitely complicated and there's not that much we can possibly understand. And so, um, and so we can only know so much, even if we work hard. Yeah, a lot of people are lazy, 
Um, a lot of people have been lazy throughout history, I suspect. I'm, I'm not a, uh, an historian and I'm gonna take my own advice and, and appeal to the experts on that. But you know, I don't see any reason to think that there was ever a time in history when everybody spent all their time studying and learning. And so I'm not sure, I actually am often uh, impressed by how hard people work to understand, or at least how hard 30% of the population works to understand. The other uh, assumption you make is that data science and AI will be able to process and deliver reasonable results. That's a tendentious claim, and I'm not sure uh, if and when data science and AI are going to be sufficient for making strong predictions about the future. Each of them, you know, each of them depends upon their inputs, right? Statistical prediction depends on the quality of the data and the quality of the statistical model. Causal modeling depends on the quality of the data and the quality of the causal model. And I've seen no reason in the world to think that either data science or AI would be able to generate unknown unknowns. And there are all kinds of examples of how machines have, got, have, have broken down in, um, in the presence of unexpected events. So it's going to be a long time before we can rely on data science and AI to make long-term difficult predictions. In terms of making, you know, predicting who's going to win the next uh, major league pennant in American baseball, yeah, maybe the, those kinds of models can be useful for doing that. Um, and, I, and I do think it's important to answer your, your first question to teach people how to make use of those models. Um, it, it's true that there's a huge amount of strength and in information in data science and AI, and people should be informed about it, and we have to you know, learn to develop those models and perspectives. Thank you very much, Miguel. Thanks for your comments, and thanks for putting this together.